positively know nothing about the situation here. I would like to have re uh, legal representation. Well, I was uh, questioned by a judge. However, I uh, course, at that time that I was not allowed legal representation uh, during that uh, that uh, very short and sweet hearing. Uh, I really don't know what the, what the situation is about. Nobody has told me anything except that I'm accused of uh, of uh, murdering a policeman. I know nothing more than that, and I do request uh, someone to come forward uh, to give me uh, a legal assistance. No, I have not been charged with that. In fact, nobody has said that to me yet. Uh, the first thing I heard about was when the newspaper reporters in the hall uh, asked me that question. You have been. Sir? You have been. Okay, we can't hear you, man. Okay, so. What did you do in Russia? The turmoil in the lineup room had long before been taken over in the police station corridors. Everyone was there wanting to see Oswald, wanting to be shown the rifle. A police officer brought the rifle out. Foreign May, the press was told. Reporters were asking questions, newspaper photographers were hustling for better angles, television cameramen were feeding pictures, and one interested bystander was just looking on that Friday night. His name, Jack Ruby. Chicago-born Ruby was a Dallas nightclub owner. He had been a beer joint, uh, he had a beer joint downtown where girls did uh, striptease dances on stage. He didn't belong in the police station. Especially at a time like this. Fortunately, Oswald's need for a lawyer soon ended. Instead of law, there was one man's impulse, or one man's plot, or the climax of a conspiracy. More questions for the Warren Commission to answer just a few moments. The next day, Sunday, Oswald, as required by Texas law, was being transferred from the city jail to the county jail. As all the world knows, and as much of America witnessed, the man who had shown up Friday evening showed up again. City Hall, and that's a scuffle on the basement floor. It seems to concern the park. He has been shot. Oswald has been shot. Lee Oswald. At Tamp and Patton, Mrs. Markham saw Oswald approach. Well, this man was walking along the sidewalk on 10th Street. This police car was uh, driving very slow down 10th Street. And what happened? Well, the man kept walking, just like I say, with his hands down in his head. He, I didn't pay him no mind, I didn't care. And this police car kept coming on, coming on, and finally he stopped, and the man stopped. And uh, whether the, man, the policeman say, come over to the car, talk to him, I don't know, but he went. Was he on the driver's side or on the other side? On the other side. And did he stick his head in the window? Yes, sir. He folded his hands like this. He put them in through the window, up on the window, and he leaned over like this. What do you remember about this man? Was he a big man or a small man? What? No, he wasn't a very big man. He was short, kind of short, so I can remember. Well, now, was he still standing there when Officer Tippett got out of the police car? Well, he got, you know, taken out, got out of the window, put his hands back down to his side, and stepped back that two steps. The policeman calmly opened the door. He calmly crawled out. And I, for me, I didn't pay no attention because I thought, you know, talk, friendly. Uh, and he, the policeman walked to the, got to the, even the front wheel on the driver's side, and this man shot it in the wink of your eyes. Just bang, bang, bang. And what did this man who had shot the officer, what did he do as soon as he had shot him? Did he move back or did he run or what? 
No, he, he didn't uh, break out and run fast. He walked fast down the side, back towards me, and then he seen me. And then he done like this. And, of course, I did, too. And then I slapped my finger, hands upon my face. But I couldn't scream. I couldn't move. But what does it do? Did he say anything at all to you? He did not. Uh, so I can tell you, I closed my eyes, and my hands right there, and then I stayed there a few minutes. And I was going to look and see if he's gone or coming after me or what. And I opened my fingers, and I looked, and he was trotting off down across this lot of here. And he wasn't even out of sight. He saw me go to the policeman. Now, he could have killed me, too. I knew I had to get help for this man. And I knew this police car, all police cars got radios in them. And I just, I'll do what I can to get help for this man. And I tried. This calls for information. We have a report that an officer has been involved in a shooting in the 400 block of East 10th, 118. And they hurt me. Did you ever speak to Lee Oswald in your life? Never have. Never. I never used the term angry. That's not in my vocabulary. What did you say about angry, Mr. Ruby? I mean, it's not in my vocabulary. It isn't my... <clears throat> this is the word angry? Yes. I mean, it was used constantly here with reference to how I felt. Matter of fact, <clears throat> I was more remorseful than angry if I lost. What are you... Specifically, what are you referring to now? The president said, oh, yeah. tell, tell us how you felt about the whole thing. He's telling you right now, look at him. I couldn't understand how great you like that. Can't understand how a great man like that can be lost. Those words from Ruby.
thought he'd come to me the Thursday, November the 21st, and asked me could he uh, ride home with me that afternoon. And I said, well, yes. And I said, well, why are you going home this afternoon? And he replied that he wanted to go home and pick up some curtain rods where he could put some curtains up in his apartment. And I said, oh, very well. And then I said, uh, well, will you be going home with me tomorrow also? And he said, no. He said he wouldn't be going home with me on the 22nd. So he told you that he wanted to come out there and pick up some curtain rods, and this was on Thursday morning. Yes. And at that time, he told you that he would not ride home with you Friday night. Right. On Friday, November 22nd, Lee Harvey Oswald rises quietly and boils water for a quick cup of instant coffee. Half an hour later, without awakening anyone, he leaves the silent Payne household. Carrying a long paper-wrapped parcel, he walks the half block to Wesley Fraser's house for his ride to the book depository. Fraser's sister, Mrs. William Randall, watches him approach this morning. About 17 a.m. in the morning, I was preparing lunches. I looked out the window and saw a man, whom I learned later was Mr. Oswald, crossing the street with a package approximately two and a half feet long. He proceeded across my carport and I opened the door to see where he was going and saw him put the package into my brother's car. Minutes later, he is joined by Frazier. I went out the back door. Lee was there standing just outside the door. We walked to the car. As we were getting in the car, I saw the package and I said, what's the package, Lee? And Lee said, Kurt Rods. And the only comment that was made on the way to work was about the babies and the weather. I always managed to get some comment out of him about the children because I see he seemed like he's very fond of them. And I asked him, did he have fun playing with the babies? And he says, oh yeah, I kind of chuckled to himself. Fifteen minutes after leaving the suburb of Irving, Wesley Frazier's 1953 Chevrolet sedan joins the flow of morning traffic speeding along Stennon's freeway toward the gray towers of downtown Dallas. About the only other comment was made was about the weather, and it was an 80 day, and we both said if it didn't clear up, it sure gonna be a bad day. It is nearing 8 o'clock when the drab bulk of the book depository looms up beyond the triple underpass. Here, the presidential motorcade is due to pass in four and a half hours. As usual, Wesley Frazier drives his car to a distant employee parking lot beside a railroad yard a four-block walk from the book depository's back entrance. But this morning, his companion is in a hurry. I said, he got out of the car, see, and picked up the package. So I was charging my battery, see. My battery ain't charging pretty bad. And then when I got out of the car and fixed the door, he started walking a little bit faster. And he finally got about 50 feet ahead of me. Soviet citizen. Somehow we managed to track him down at the Metropole Hotel, 
I remember the room number was 233. I found this young man there, rather slight, fair-haired. He was quite intense and determined. He was a master dealer and said that it always had been his ideal to live in Russia. His name was Lee Harvey Oswald. He struck me as being uh, a little unbalanced, obviously with personal problems. He had been brought up without a father. He admitted that he had had not very many friends in school, although he insisted he had had rather normal life, playing football and basketball and so forth. He said he had begun to read books by Mark five years before that, when he was 15. Then he served in the Marine Corps, and he could hardly wait to get out, he said, so that he could go to the Soviet Union. And he said when he finally got out of the Marines that it was like getting out of prison. He came to Russia and applied for Soviet citizenship. He told me that he wanted to be an electronics engineer, and he said that if living in the Soviet Union meant getting married and having a family, that he would stay there and do that. Little did I dream that I was talking to the man who is charged today with the assassination of President Kennedy of the United States. This is Aline Mosby of the United States International in Paris. By the time police secured the depository building, an employee, Lee Harvey Oswald, had already slipped out. Well, that's when uh, someone came up and knocked on the door of the bus. Although this is no bus stop here, knocked on the door of the bus, and I opened the door, and, and a man got on the bus and uh, paid his fare. Bus driver Cecil McWaters says that man was Oswald. But with the bus mired in traffic, the passenger got off and caught a cab. Well, he just looked like an ordinary working man. He's got in, said he wanted to go 500 block North Beckley. Oswald went to his boarding house and picked up his pistol. In Dallas, Texas, three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade in downtown Dallas. The first reports say that President Kennedy has been seriously wounded by this shooting. Well, I was listening, uh, had the television on, listening, trying to find out what happened to President Kennedy when he came in. It must have been after one o'clock. He come in and he wasn't running, he was just in a fast walk. I just said, are you sure in a hurry? And he didn't answer me and didn't say nothing. When he went out, he went out walking fast the same way. And I was still listening there and bound broadcasting about President Kennedy. There were no witnesses to the route I took. This police car stopped. The policeman calmly opened the door. He but sometime before 1.15, Helen Markham saw police officer J.D. Tippett stop Oswald near the corner of 10th and Patton. He folded his hands like this. He put them in through the window, up on the window, and he leaned over like this. For me, I didn't pay no attention because I thought, this, you know, tall, friendly. Uh, and he, the policeman walked to the, got to the, even the front wheel on the driver's side, and this man shot him in the wink of your eyes. Just bang, bang, bang. He didn't uh, break out and run fast. He walked fast down the sidewalk, back towards me, and then he seen me. And then he done like this. And of course I did too, and then I slapped my finger, hands up on my face. But I couldn't scream, I couldn't move. But what was it doing? We have a report that an officer has been involved in a shooting in the 400 block of East 10th. The intersection is about a mile from Oswald's boarding house. And there are skeptics who question whether Oswald could travel that distance and shoot Officer Tippett in less than 15 minutes. But other witnesses saw him running from the area. I was just standing on the front porch of our used car lot office, and uh, I heard some shooting. What well, sounded to me like five shots. I could see clearly he had this pistol in what we used to, in the Marine Corps, call the raised pistol position. And uh, he was... He wasn't on a, a dead run, but a good, fast trot. And uh, I noticed that he was very pale. He was just deathly white. And uh, I hollered at him. I said, man, what in the hell is going on? And he almost stopped and said something to me, which I could not understand. And uh, I ran down in the direction of the shooting, and I saw Officer Tippett laying in the street. Uh, I could tell by looking at him that he was dead. Uh, he was laying on his pistol. And then I ran to the squad car and called in on the radio. 
told them that an officer had been shot. And uh, they said that someone else had already reported it, so for me to stay off the air. Suspect last seen running west on Jefferson. From there, the trail led to a shoe store where salesman Johnny Brewer talked to Dallas reporter Eddie Barker. He walked in, the police made a U-turn, and he looked over his shoulder. He just looked uh, scared. His shirt tail was out, and he looked like he'd been running. They broadcast a description on the radio of this man of 5'8", 5'9", 150 pounds. And this Oswald matched the description. And well, just a few minutes before he walked into the lobby, on the radio they had a bulletin that an officer had been shot here in Oak Cliff. And he walked in, he matched the description. Were there a lot of police cars in yeah, the area? Yeah, there was uh, a lot of police cars. Uh, there were some cars coming up Jefferson Street. When they did, Oswald turned and walked up to the theater. When he went out the lobby and toward the theater, I walked out to the sidewalk and watched him go in. Then uh, I f walked up to the theater and asked Miss Postal there, the cashier, if she had sold a ticket to this man wearing the brown sports shirt, you know, his description. Uh, she called the police. Did they get a suspect? I believe we have him in the uh, Texas theater now. 10-4. Police grabbed me and uh, asked me what I was doing there, and I told them. And they asked me if the man was still in the theater. I said yes. They asked me to uh, point him out, so. Uh, Johnny Brewer from the shoe store and a couple other officers on the stage, and he had pointed into the direction of the rear theater and said that was a man that uh, we were looking for sitting at the rear of the theater alone. Dallas patrolman M.M. McDonald in 1964 demonstrated to reporter Eddie Barker how he subdued and captured Oswald in the Texas theater. He was sitting in that seat there with his hands in his lap. And as, I, wa as I walked up to the aisle, I turned in the aisle, I said, get on your feet. And he stood up immediately. He brought this right hand up to his chest. Did he say anything when you As he was bringing that? his hands up, he brought the other one up to eye level. He said, well, it's all over now. That time, I was reaching this way, and his hand got in front of mine, owned a pistol. My hand grabbed the pistol in this manner, and he hit me with that uh, left hand to the nose. And when he did, I came back and hit him like this. He slapped the pistol. I turned the pistol around, and I got my hand on the butt. It came over like this. I was holding him with this hand. I handed this pistol to an officer that was out in the aisle. We had a shooting of a police officer, which is DOA at Methodist. The suspect has been apprehended at Texas Theater and route the station. Have there been any developments that you can tell me on the suspect that shot the officer? Was there any connection with the uh, shooting of the president? He was carrying the revolver that tests would later show was used to kill Tippett. It was just two hours after he left the school book depository. Oswald was arrested for the murder of J.D. Tippett, but when he arrived here at the Dallas police station, officers realized that he was also the employee reported missing from the Texas school book depository. And that's when Lee Harvey Oswald became the first and the only suspect in the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Given me a hearing without legal representation or anything. Did you shoot the president? I didn't shoot anybody, no, sir. Oh, God, we got to indoctrinate this guy. Let's keep it quiet. We'll all get it. Hold it down. Has, has, has the gentleman been identified? Yes, sir. He's been identified for killing the officer. Right. Has any Wait. identification been attempted for the killing of the president? Not yet. I didn't shoot anybody, sir. I haven't been told what I'm please, here for. Do you have a lawyer? No, sir, I don't. I like him.
legal representation. These police officers have not allowed me to, to have any. Okay. I, uh, I don't know what this is all about. I'll get the black guy. No, so I did. People How'd keep asking me that. Guy? Sir? You shoot the president? I work in that building. Were you in the building at the time? Naturally, if I work in that building, yes, sir. Back up, man. Did you shoot the president? No, they're taking me in because of the fact that I live in the Soviet Union. I'm just a patsy. It was a calculating man who slew the president of these United States today. He had to be. The shots that killed the president and severely wounded the governor of Texas came from a predetermined spot with a clear view of the motorcade as it passed. Oswald was paraded in front of the press. He had just been charged with the murder of Officer Tibbet, and he was about to be charged with the assassination of President Kennedy. what role Oswald might have played in the shooting. It does hold the answer to whether or not President Kennedy was killed by a lone assassin. Simply stated. Uh, I really don't know what, what the situation is about. Nobody has told me anything except that I'm accused of, uh, of uh, murdering a police chief. I know nothing more than that. I do request uh, someone to come forward to give me uh, a legal assistance. Did you kill the president? No, I've not been charged with that. In fact, nobody has said that to me yet. Uh, the first thing I heard about it was when the newspaper reporters in the hall uh, asked me that question. You have been Nobody said what? Sir? You have been Nobody said what? Okay, man. Okay. What did you do in Russia? A policeman hit me. In Dallas, the prime suspect still is being questioned. He is 24-year-old Lee Oswald of Dallas, a former Marine who spent some time in Russia, who at one time had applied for Soviet citizenship. He has been associated with the Fair Play for Cuba that is Committee. shooting himself, and Dallas Police Chief Just Harry describes him as a stoic individual who admits nothing. He believes he's being held because he once lived in Russia. Oswald, who said two years ago he wanted Russian citizenship, was fined $10 recently in New Orleans for distributing communist literature. He's married to a Russian woman who was brought to the police station with their small daughter his, and his mother, who lives in a Dallas suburb. She was also questioned and said, I am heartbroken about this. He is really a good boy. Oswald's only comment to the world at large since his arrest has been a denial. Appeared at the police station during the night carrying a small child. Oswald married her in the late 1950s when he was in Russia trying to renounce his American citizenship. Mrs. Oswald, who speaks only limited English, seemed stunned by all that was happening to her and her husband. Police said she told them that her husband owned a gun matching the description of the one believed used in the assassination of the president. Here comes Oswald down the hall again. Did you find that rifle? I don't know what you people have been given, but I emphatically deny these charges. Oswald has hustled uh, through a doorway. He says he has nothing against anybody. He has not committed any act of violence. Oswald makes this claim as he's hustled from the interrogation room through a doorway down an elevator. Uh, up an elevator. I have the photograph and the t-shirt. Now they're taking me to the line up. Among these men, that's what we have will be kicked out. Right? Oh, God, we got to indoctrinate this guy. Thank you. 
Let's keep it right here, gentlemen. Let's keep it right here. When he went into this questioning session, he was still denying everybody, saying he had nothing to do with killing the president. This room is packed with some 30 or 40 news units at the stage. Oswald presumably has been taken back upstairs to the fourth floor of police headquarters where the Dallas City Jail is located. He will be transferred later, apparently sometime later today, to the county jail, a routine procedure for prisoners who have been released. As of this moment, of course, Oswald is charged with the murder of Tyrone Kennedy. That charge came early today. A policeman hit me. Throughout that weekend, Oswald was questioned by the police, the FBI, and the Secret Service. He never confessed to killing the president. His brother Robert went to see him in custody. I'm looking into his eyes. I'm looking for some sign, something. He says, brother, you won't find anything there. And he was absolutely right. There was nothing there. There was no emotion that you could see whatsoever. Even without a confession, the district attorney, Henry Wade, said he was confident. Excuse me, got a good case. I figure we have sufficient evidence to convict him. Was this, uh, is there any indication that this was an organized plot, or was it just one man? We, there's no one else but him. Oswald would never go to trial. Now, this is the armored truck that will carry Lee Oswald from the basement here of Dallas Police Headquarters downtown to the Dallas County Jail. On Sunday, November the 24th, the press had been told they could cover Oswald's transfer from police headquarters to the county jail to be at the basement loading dock by 10 a.m. Cap instructed me to handcuff Oswald's right arm to my left arm. While I was doing all this, I said to him in jest more than anything else, I said, Lee, if anybody shoots at you, I hope they're as good a shot as you are, meaning, of course, they'd hit him and not me. He kind of laughed and he said, oh, you're being melodramatic or something to that effect. So nobody's going to shoot at me. Yeah, there is Lee Oswald. He's been shot. He's been shot. Lee Oswald has been shot. I pulled on Oswald, jerked on him, trying to pull him behind me, but I was too close to him to move him. So I turned his body so that the bullet, instead of hitting him dead center, it hit him about four inches to the left of the navel. Oswald has been shot. Lee Oswald. It was like a cartoon almost, where you see a foot there and a hand there and a, and a gun. Oswald was only enrolled in Easton High School for about a month when the family moved back to Fort Worth, Texas. But several girls, now married women, who attended junior high school with him, remember him. He's just very, very quiet and kept to himself. He was in my homeroom, but... I don't remember much about him because he wasn't very personable. He didn't seem to get along with everybody, talk a lot. Then he, uh, he did best in, in civics and art while he was at Beauregard, and, and we a lot of times associate an artist with a, with a nonconformist, a person who doesn't dress or act like other people. Did, did this kind of fit the description of, of Lee Oswald? Yes, it did. He was kind of like, well, he was like an oddball. He just didn't mix with other, with other kids in school. Do any of you uh, ever remember him having any difficulties in class with any of his teachers? Did he, uh, did he seem to get along with all of his teachers or did, was he uh, a belligerent person in, in class? Did he argue with teachers? No, he more or less kind of wanted to do things for him. Don't you think he was that type of... Yeah, what I remember, I mean, he was a good student and wasn't a troublemaker. He seemed more yeah. like a bookworm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, he mentioned also in his history record that he, he liked to read a lot. Did he did uh, did he carry a lot of books? Do you ever notice him carrying a lot of books, more books than other students, for example? No, just the usual books take class. Uh, there have been uh, a couple of people in the city who uh, knew Lee Oswald after he he grew up when he came back to New Orleans, and they said that. They almost immediately knew 
that it was Lee Oswald who had, had assassinated the president. I, I realize that uh, at 14 years old, it's probably a little early to form an opinion, but uh, did Lee, the Lee Oswald that attended Beauregard Junior High seem to be the, the, the type of person who would uh, commit such an act? No, but like they say, that's the one you have to watch, the quiet ones, and you don't know what they're going to do. He didn't seem I, like it then. I can never remember him just laughing or smiling. He always just sort of smirked like a tight lip. By all accounts, Oswald was a loner. He himself said he had no close friends. The girls didn't remember anyone who was particularly close to him. But there was one young student, Edward Vogel, who went out of his way to befriend Oswald, and he tells about it. Would you tell us uh, your first encounter, as you can recall? This has been, uh, what, about eight? It was about eight years eight ago. Years ago. Tell us about it. Uh, well, uh, he came in uh, Beauregard's uh, mid-semester, and uh, he had uh, a fight with a couple of boys, and that's how I first uh, saw him. And uh, after the, the next day, uh, someone had punched him in the mouth that uh, Oswald didn't know, I didn't know, uh, uh, and I don't think the boy even know him knew him. Uh, I think these boys that he had a fight with him put this other guy up to punch him in the mouth to get back at him because Oswald did uh, beat the other boys and uh, Oswald was laying down on the ground and I ran up to him and I think a couple other boys did too and we brought him back into school and uh, washed his mouth off and put some uh, cold compressors on his mouth and this is uh more or less the start of a friendship between you and Oswald at that time? Well, that's when we first met, uh, was when this happened. And uh, what type of boy was he at 15? I understand uh, this was about the age of, of that year. Well, um, he didn't uh, seem to mix too well with the uh, rest of the uh, boys or the girls or anyone there at the school. He didn't seem to have any uh, friends, or he didn't seem to be really interested in anything. Uh, he didn't uh, participate in any extra curricular activities. Uh, he was just a, a loner, it seemed like. I'll tell you one one reason I'm concerned about the age of uh, 15. This reportedly is when uh, Oswald first became interested or came in contact with the Marxist theory. Now, did he, at any time during your relationship with him, did he mention anything about his readings of uh, uh, leftist or Marxist uh, uh, literature? No, he, uh, he didn't mention uh, anything at all about uh, any politics or socialism, communism, Marxism, or anything, and I don't believe that's true. I don't believe he had any really basic ideas on uh, Marxism or anything at 15 years old. I think uh, that came later somewhere along the line because he'd never mentioned anything like that to me at all.